With a number of fighter programs underway all around the world claiming to be fielding sixth generation fighters, one can't help but stop and wonder, what exactly is a sixth generation fighter anyway? After all, the fourth generation of fighters produced some 46 different aircraft, and today there are only four fifth generation fighters in service on the planet. And there's some debate regarding even that. Are the technologies in development today for aircraft like the NGAD, the FAXX, Tempest, or the FCAS fighters really so groundbreaking that they could warrant yet another addition to the generational hierarchy. And if so, what could those technologies be? Let's dive into this. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. You don't have to go far these days to find nations or aviation firms claiming to be developing new 5th and even 6th generation fighters. With at least a dozen ongoing fighter programs underway around the globe as I speak, and a high likelihood that there are others in the early planning stages that have yet to be disclosed. But for all the discussion about 4th generation, 5th generation, and 6th generation fighters going around, many of you might be surprised to learn that these fighter generational designations are really more about marketing than genuine capability. And to some extent, that's by design. The concept of fighter generations is actually a fairly recent development, emerging in military academia only months before the YF-22 and YF-23 squared off in the advanced tactical fighter competition that would lead to the world's first fifth generation fighter. Now there is some debate as to who exactly we can credit for coming up with the idea, but many sources point to a 1990 paper penned by Dr. Richard Hallion entitled A Troubling Past, Air Force Fighter Acquisitions Since 1945. Now, Hellion wasn't an aerospace engineer or a fighter pilot himself. He was a military historian and an advisor. And in that formative paper, he actually contended that there were already six generations of jet fighters in active service at the time. Those six generations would soon be whittled down to the four we know today, right around the time Lockheed Martin and the U.S. Air Force began marketing the forthcoming F-22 Raptor as the first of a new generation, the fifth generation of fighters. And true to form, when the F-22 Raptor emerged from development, it really was an incredible technological leap over all previous fighter designs. The Raptor delivered jaw-dropping performance akin to the fourth-generation hot rods that it came to replace, but it also incorporated the first-ever use of what came to be called offensive stealth. To that point, low observability had been relegated to attack aircraft like the F-117 and bombers like the B-2, jets that used their stealth to avoid enemy defenses. The F-22, on the other hand, aimed to use stealth very differently. Rather than tiptoeing around enemy combat patrols and surface-to-air missiles, the Raptor was designed to prowl the skies, hidden beneath the cloak of radar and visibility as it looked for a fight. The F-22 proved so groundbreaking that it became the model, the very basis for what we came to call the fifth generation of fighters. In fact, every capability the Raptor brought to bear was listed as a generational requirement at the time, from sensor fusion to super cruising and everything in between. But then, other advanced new fighters began to emerge. Aircraft that stood head and shoulders above the fourth generation technologically, but that lacked some of the insane performance characteristics or extreme stealth provided by the F-22. Lockheed Martin's F-35 delivered greater degrees of sensor fusion, powerful data crunching onboard computers, a similar degree of stealth, but nowhere near the same jaw-dropping performance. It was clear to anyone looking at the F-35 next to the F-16 it was meant to replace that this new stealth fighter was anything but a fourth generation jet. But it fell well short of the insane performance requirements we defined 
by using the F-22. This new F-35 couldn't supercruise or fly at speeds of Mach 1.5 or higher without the use of its afterburner. It lacked the Raptor's thrust vectoring super maneuverability, its ability to operate at extremely high altitudes, higher than 60,000 feet, and it couldn't carry enough weapons internally to effectively engage both air and ground targets in the same sortie. But... The F-35's stealth and data fusion made it so broadly capable that it clearly belonged to the same new generation as the Raptor. So, the commonly accepted requirements to be considered a fifth-generation fighter slowly changed to encompass both the F-22 and the F-35. Of course, that did take time. In fact, Eurofighter continued to argue that the F-35 was not a fifth-generation fighter as late as 2010. Now, that same year, in 2010, Russia's Su-57 made its debut flight. Now, it offered greater aerobatic performance than the F-35, but in an airframe that was nowhere near as stealthy as either of Lockheed Martin's entries. This new Russian fighter boasted a reported radar cross-section that was probably 15 times or more smaller than the Su-27s. That made it stealth by Russian standards anyway, even if that was literally hundreds, if not thousands of times larger than either the F-22 or the F-35 on radar screens. And just like that, the collective definition of the fifth generation continued to shift, emphasizing design intent over actual performance and reducing the generally accepted generational requirements to a narrow few, primarily a design that prioritizes stealth from the onset, advanced data fusing avionics, and multi-role capabilities. Now, a year later, in 2011, China's Chengdu J-20 made its first flight, marking the fourth and final to date entry into this elite fraternity of fighters. This new aircraft, which benefited from elements of both American and Russian stealth fighter designs, was not considered a fifth-generation fighter in its country of origin, however, because China had developed its own fighter generational hierarchy with the most modern and stealthy platforms considered fourth-generation by their standards. Put simply, fighter generational designations went from being a general form of retrospective categorization for academics to becoming trendy buzzwords tossed about by marketing reps in aviation firms and by national governments for the sake of geopolitical posturing. Like the term hypersonic today, calling a new fighter fifth generation became a means to advance perceptions of a fighter's capability, rather than a way to truly classify its actual capabilities. And that brings us to today, where these generational designations have become so ubiquitous that even Northrop Grumman is advertising their B-21 Raider as the world's first sixth-generation aircraft, even though it's not a fighter, and as such, has nothing to do with their generational designations. Both China and Russia have claimed to have their own early sixth-generation fighter programs in development, even as they work toward fielding fleets of fifth-generation fighters and continue to develop adequate air warfare doctrine for low-observable aircraft in the first place. The United States Air Force and Navy are both happy to tell you that they have sixth-generation fighters in development, both of which emerged from the same classified 2015 X-Plane program. But as for what capabilities exactly make these fighters so incredible that they're an entire generation ahead of the F-22 or the F-35, well, nobody can really say for sure. We know that these new aircraft in development are meant to fly as the centerpiece of a family of systems in which the crewed fighter is connected via secure data link to a bevy of AI-enabled drone wingmen that can carry out a variety of combat operations on behalf of the pilot. These drones will be able to fly out ahead to extend sensor reach, engage ground or even air targets with their own munitions, provide electronic warfare support, and a whole bunch more. But is this capability alone enough to justify calling these jets sixth generation? 
In March of 2023, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall announced that the Air Force intends to produce at least 1,000 AI-enabled drones from the forthcoming Collaborative Combat Aircraft, or CCA, program, with at least 300 of those drones already earmarked to fly alongside upgraded Block 4 F-35s. If flying with drone wingmen alone is what it takes to be considered 6th generation, does that make the Block 4 F-35 6th generation? Would it be a viable candidate to call a 5.5 generation? Or is just adding drone wingmen alone not sufficient to justify a 6th generation title at all? After all, even the whittled down requirements for the fifth generation included more than a single new capability, regardless of how groundbreaking that capability may be. It's important to remember that stealth for fighters was also a groundbreaking capability, but data fusion is still seen as just as important to the fifth generation. The truth is, there really are no right or wrong answers to this question, because these generational designations are sort of living things that adapt to popular consensus, meaning the real winner will ultimately be the definition that garners the most industry, organizational, and popular support. But for whatever my part of the discourse is worth, I would contend that simply adding AI-enabled drones, as groundbreaking and significant as that truly will be, isn't quite enough to justify a new generational title. Truly fielding a sixth generation fighter will require even more than that. So let's briefly run through some of the other systems, capabilities, or technologies that I expect to see come to define this new generation of fighters, even if they don't necessarily manifest in the earliest years that these new jets are in service. And we'll start with the simplest one modular design. You see, to this point, fighter designs have not prioritized upgradability hardly at all. Hardware and software has largely been married to one another, with systems designed to function on the software they came with and not really to accept or absorb any new software changes. As a result, upgrading an aircraft or adding new capabilities often requires changing out physical systems, and that adds a huge amount of expense in terms of custom fabrication and going back and retrofitting past airframes, and then the added expense of having to put the new complete aircraft through the same rigorous testing regime it had to before to make sure that all those significant changes to the hardware of the aircraft haven't negatively affected any of the other systems. And that brings us back to that family of systems phrase we keep hearing from the Air Force and the Navy. That phrase represents far more than just a new fighter and drone airframes. It instead reflects a variety of modular systems that are designed with open system architecture to allow for faster, simpler upgrades and some degree of commonality among even very different aircraft. This will allow these platforms to absorb new technologies, countermeasures, weapon systems, flight software, and more over time, keeping them relevant over their decades of service without massive budget-busting upgrade efforts like the ones we're seeing today in the F-22. As insane as the Raptor is, it just wasn't designed to be easy to upgrade, and as a result, the U.S. is investing about $11 billion right now into updating just 150 F-22 Raptors to keep them at the top of their game for long enough for NGAD to fly in and replace them. The F-35, on the other hand, was among the first fighters to be designed with some degree of upgradability in mind, and as such, can even receive software updates wirelessly like you might with a new iPhone. And as I learned from my buddy F-35 pilot Hazard Lee, who helped establish the training doctrine for these aircraft for the entire U.S. Air Force, and who also has a great YouTube channel you should check out, there have been days where he's walked out to the flight line and climbed into the same F-35 he flew the day prior, but thanks to a software update, the aircraft had new capabilities it never had before. But as we're seeing in real time with delays and challenges associated with the F-35's Tech Refresh 3, which is a series of software and hardware upgrades meant to support the forthcoming Block 4 upgrade, which will be substantial, it's still not very easy 
to swap out systems in these aircraft. And I would expect these next generation fighters, which will be sharing modular systems that are run with open software architecture meant to allow other companies to step in and upgrade or replace previous companies' work, will be a whole lot better about this. All right, the next technology I think could help set sixth generation fighters apart is transitioning away from polymer-based radar absorbent materials and toward ceramic-based ones. Modern stealth fighters leverage radar reflecting designs that are meant to deflect electromagnetic waves away from the aircraft rather than directly back at the radar receiver. But these designs alone aren't really enough to make a modern jet truly stealth. These aircraft are also covered in layers of radar-absorbing materials, or RAM, that dramatically reduces their returns. The RAM used by modern American fighters has been rated to absorb upwards of 70 or even 80% of inbound electromagnetic energy, or radar waves. But it's also very expensive and time-consuming to maintain, and represents a big chunk of why it's so pricey to operate platforms like the F-22 and the F-35. Now, current polymer-based radar-absorbing materials are also very susceptible to damage from friction and heat, which is a huge problem at supersonic speeds. In fact, the risk of damaging the radar-absorbing materials on the tail section of the F-35 B and C has limited these aircraft's supersonic capabilities to short sprints of just under 60 seconds, except in cases of emergency. But... Back in 2021, a research team out of North Carolina State University led by a woman named Cheryl Zhu announced the development of a new ceramic-based radar-absorbing material that could be used for tactical fighter applications. This new form of RAM is said to absorb even more electromagnetic energy, upwards of 90%, while also being water-resistant, harder than sand, and capable of withstanding temperatures as high as 3,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, modern polymer-based radar-absorbing materials start to break down at around 480 degrees or so. Parts of the SR-71 would see temperatures as high as 950 degrees while flying at speeds above Mach 3. Using this new ceramic-based RAM would allow for maintaining high supersonic speeds for extended periods of time while dramatically reducing the maintenance requirements for each stealth fighter. In conjunction with other new stealth design elements we'll talk about here in a minute, this could allow for the highest performing stealth aircraft ever fielded, making it not just possible but downright practical to field fighters that can match or even exceed some of the hot rod performance we saw in fourth generation jets like the F-15. In fact, ceramic RAM with the new adaptive cycle engines in development today could allow for fighters that fly at higher altitudes, higher speeds, and longer durations than any fighters ever have before. Now, Cheryl Zhu's team secured funding from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research a few years ago, and to be clear, they're not the only folks working on these sorts of advancements in radar-absorbent coatings. So it really doesn't seem outside the realm of possibility that this ceramic RAM could be ready for service by 2030 or so, when the first of these sixth generation fighters are expected to come online. All right, and while we're talking stealth, let's talk about the next capability I expect to see in sixth generation fighters. It's something that I call low frequency stealth. You see, modern stealth fighters are designed to be exceedingly difficult to detect, track, or target using the high-frequency radar arrays that can effectively guide a missile into a target. But not all arrays operate on those same high frequencies. Some advanced air defense systems today also leverage low-frequency radar arrays, which can't provide the image fidelity required to guide a weapon into a target, but can see further and in some specific circumstances, can even provide early warning of inbound stealth fighters. Now that's because while stealth fighters may be designed to defeat targeting from high frequency arrays, standard fighter design elements like large gaping jet inlets and standing vertical tail surfaces can sometimes produce a resonance that can be detectable by these low frequency arrays. Now that can allow air defense personnel to orient their high frequency targeting arrays in the general direction of that resonance, allowing them to more quickly acquire a lock on a stealth fighter that happens to fly close enough to that array to be targeted. Because make no mistake about it, even stealth fighters 
can be targeted by just about any air defense system, provided they're close enough. Stealth fighters are snipers, not ninjas. They're meant to fight at a distance where their tiny radar return can blend into the noise of everything else around them. Now, stealth bombers, on the other hand, don't need to perform the same kind of aerobatic maneuvers that a fighter does, and as such, can omit those resonance-producing design elements. Their jet inlets are recessed, and they have no standing tail surfaces at all. Put simply, when a stealth fighter is operating above you, you probably know that it's there, you just can't get a lock on it. But when a stealth bomber is operating over your nation, you may never even know it was there at all, if not for some really important buildings nearby suddenly going missing. Now, the renders we've seen of sixth generation fighters in development released by US based firms all show fighters that omit those standing vertical tail surfaces and that understate their jet inlets, clearly pointing toward a transition to bomber like design methodology that would make these fighters extremely difficult to detect and track not just against high-frequency targeting arrays, but against low-frequency early warning arrays as well. And to that very point, even the Congressional Research Service's summary of the Air Force's Next Generation Air Dominance Sixth Generation Fighter Program states, in plain English, that this new fighter may have more in common with the B-21 Raider than it does with past fighters like the F-22 Raptor. But this may well end up being one of those generational points of contention, because the sixth generation renders we've seen out of European-based firms, like the UK-led Tempest or the French-led Future Combat Air System, both show more of a YF-23 style all-moving V-tail. Now that type of tail design really does allow for a high degree of stealth and would dramatically reduce the chances of a low-frequency resonance, but I'm not sure it would be quite enough to justify claiming low-frequency stealth in the same way an aircraft without any standing tail surfaces might. Now, to be clear though, calculating the radar return for an aircraft against a single frequency is an immensely complicated process, let alone comparing returns across different frequencies, so I may well ultimately be proved wrong about the degree of low-frequency stealth provided by these all-moving V-tails. Or, low-frequency stealth may be something that we see in these emerging American sixth-generation fighters, but that ultimately isn't considered a requirement for the generation. Similar to the way the F-22 Raptors' super cruising and super maneuverability were once seen as requirements for the fifth generation, but then were tossed aside as more advanced fighters emerged that didn't have those same capabilities. And as for the loss of aerobatic maneuverability that these sixth generation fighters may experience as a result of omitting those standing vertical tails and similar control surfaces, to some extent that could be offset not just through advanced fly-by-wire control, but also through the creative use of thrust vector control and maybe even active flow control. Now, as we've discussed a number of times in the past, thrust vector control is effectively the ability to orient the outflow of your jet's thrust somewhat independent of the airframe. Now, this is what makes aircraft like the F-22 or Russia's Su-35 so maneuverable at air shows. But what often goes under-discussed is the real value of thrust vector control, which is allowing for a higher degree of aerobatic control while flying at extremely high altitudes, where the air is so thin that it flowing over control surfaces doesn't have the same effect as it might in lower, denser aired altitudes. As for active flow control, that is a much more complicated concept that deserves a video in its own right, but put very simply, it's the idea of changing the direction of airflow over an aircraft without using moving control surfaces to do so, and there's more than one way to skin that cat. One method posited by the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics includes routing puffs of air from the jet engine to carefully placed holes all around the aircraft's fuselage, effectively producing little bursts or puffs of gas that would help reorient the direction of the aircraft or move the way the air is flowing over it. Another approach published in the Journal of Applied Physics calls for using an array of electrodes on the skin of the aircraft fuselage and wings. And these electrodes would produce an electrical discharge at specific times and locations to quickly heat up the air around it 
changing the air's density and in turn how that air affects the flight of the aircraft as it passes over, under, or through it. Now these concepts are the basis for DARPA's ongoing control of revolutionary aircraft with novel effectors, or CRANE program. And literally just a few weeks ago, DARPA announced that this program has completed its design phase, approving Aurora Flight Sciences to move forward with the construction on a full-scale experimental aircraft, dubbed the X-65. Now, details about the X-65 are still pretty sparse, but it's expected that it'll come with a modular wing design that allows them to experiment with a variety of forms of active flow control. But this video has already gone on for long enough, and if you want to learn more about the X-65, let me know and we'll make a whole video about it. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment with what I should cover next. Then, of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.